Um, as we've seen, the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed in December will have varying impacts on Vermonters and Vermont businesses. And as there is with any major policy changes, there will be both winners and losers. In Vermont, we've been working to assess these impacts and identify where we can lessen any burdens or maximize any added benefits. I'm pleased to be here today with Don George, CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, to talk about some steps they're taking to pass along some of the benefits the company is seeing through its members. Don will share more details in a moment, but in summary, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont now expects to see an unanticipated multi-million dollar credit due to federal tax reforms, a credit they are committed to passing on to their members. I also want to recognize uh, Green Mountain Power and Vermont Gas, uh, as both companies have also pledged to return the tax benefit they are seeing to their ratepayers. As you know, I appreciate any opportunity we can take in Vermont to slow growth in the cost of living as my administration continues its work to make Vermont more affordable. As I've said in the past, as a matter of principle, I believe that we need to do more to keep costs of living from growing faster than the growth in the economy. And I want to be clear, we have much more work to do on this front, but I want to take a moment today and acknowledge the transparency from these companies and their commitment to using this tax credit to diminish further increases. So while we think about making Vermont more affordable and ensuring Vermonters benefit from federal changes, I want to thank the legislature for working with my administration on our proposals for tax reform and tax breaks for Social Security beneficiaries. Again, it may seem counterintuitive, but while the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will actually lower federal taxes for most Vermonters, due to the complexity of Vermont's tax system, it's actually going to inadvertently raise state income taxes on Vermont taxpayers. If lawmakers do nothing to rectify this situation, about half of Vermonters, primarily working families with kids, will pay a net total of $30 million more in Vermont income tax. We can't allow an accidental $30 million tax increase on Vermont's working families. That's why I propose a plan that not only protects Vermonters from this increase, but also achieves additional benefits in the process. My proposal simplifies our system, but maintains our progressive tax code and makes sure that Vermont uh, is more competitive with other states through lower tax rates. Our proposal is revenue neutral and ensures most Vermonters, Vermonters will not see an increase in what they pay in Vermont taxes this year due to the uh, federal action. The changes that we proposed allow working families with children to receive the full benefit of federal tax reductions without requiring cuts in state spending. Additionally, it greatly simplifies Vermont's tax calculation, lowers rates, and encourages charitable giving while adding stability in revenue collection. Now, I'm encouraged that the legislature is giving this plan some discussion and our Department of Taxes is working to analyze the latest proposals. There's a lot of common ground here, but I have some concerns about putting our income tax and Social Security tax proposals together with an education finance package that complicates these plans and moves us further away from the discussion on reforms and cost containment in our education system. It is my hope that we can work with the legislature to keep these separate focus on areas of agreement and work together to make Vermont more affordable. Whether through common sense tax reforms or companies stepping up uh, to pass them along the benefits to Vermonters, this is another opportunity to make Vermont more affordable so we can help all Vermonters get ahead and become more competitive with other states, aiming to attract more working families here to our beautiful state. With that, I'd like to turn this over to Don George to share more on the steps Blue Cross Blue Shield is taking on this front. Don? Thank you, Governor Scott, uh, for inviting me today and for that, that nice introduction. Um, this is a day that I have been anticipating and looking forward to since uh, the change into the new year. Uh, it was at that time uh, that I became aware uh, for the first time that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield 
members uh, that there was a high likelihood would experience lower premium increases over the next several years as a result of recently enacted federal tax legislation. And indeed, over the, the next uh, several days and weeks, uh, we were able to confirm that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and its members um, are positively impacted in two ways uh, by the elimination of the Corporate Alternative Minimum Tax, or AMT, and the Federal uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, the first of these two positive impacts is that beginning in 2018, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont will no longer have a federal tax obligation, and federal income tax, <coughs> therefore, will no longer be included in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont premiums. Uh, the estimated <coughs> impact of this positive development is just under 1% of insured premiums, or between two and three million dollars annually. So the elimination of our federal tax obligation will absolutely accrue to our members through lower annual premiums beginning next year. The second of these positive impacts is that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont should receive a significant but very unanticipated federal tax refund as a result of the elimination of the corporate alternative minimum tax. Um, the tax refund totaling approximately $30 million, will be paid to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont over a four-year four period beginning towards the end of 2019 and extending for a four-year period through to 2022. Again, uh, we're here today uh, to announce uh, that the full impact of these changes will be dedicated to mitigating our future premium increases on behalf of all Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont employee, uh, customers. I think most of you know that Blue Cross Blue Shield covers nearly a quarter million Vermonters. We provide health care coverage to over 120 large employers, to about 3,000 small business owners and their employees, and nearly 20,000 individual purchasers of qualified health uh, plans on Vermont's health benefit exchange. And while today's uh, development uh, is a very positive and welcome uh, form of premium relief to all Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont customers. I would say, nevertheless, uh, this premium uh, relief needs to be understood in the full context of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's total premium and claim obligations. Each year, we process and pay nearly $1.5 billion in medically necessary covered services to the Vermonters whom we serve. So I think today uh, there are two takeaways. One is that $30 million is a significant amount of money to Blue Cross Blue Shield and our customers. Indeed, a significant amount of money in Vermont. Uh, and we will pass all of this on to our ratepayers. The, uh, the annual uh, federal tax liability um, will begin uh, today and, and be reflected in premiums beginning next year. And then uh, the tax refund beginning in 2019 through years 2022. By the same token, uh, $30 million in its mitigating effect needs to be seen in the context of $1.5 billion in obligation that is paid out each year by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont to the members that it serves. In closing, and perhaps to answer a question you might have, from the time that I learned of this uh, tax refund. It never occurred to me that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont would use these funds for any other purpose other than providing premium relief to our members. For we operate solely for the benefit of our members, and it is entirely consistent with our company and customer values and our commitment to Vermonters that the full impact of this tax refund be dedicated to mitigating future premium increases. Thank you uh, for being here today. And I'll turn it back over to Governor Scott. Thank you very much, Don. With that, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions, maybe on this subject first, if you have any. How much of a savings per member do you think that would be? Uh, do you have an estimate of that? Um, you know, for the tax refund that's going to begin in 2019 through 2020, uh, we don't. Uh, we'd have to, you know, understand what premiums are going to look like at that time. Uh, that is going to accrue to all of our members. Um, some are self-insured, some are fully insured. Different amounts will accrue to them based on those funding mechanisms. Um, I can say that for the annual uh, tax uh, obligation uh, that we no longer have, this will be uh, reflected in initially in our first premium in filing in May, 
uh, to small business owners and individuals that are in our qualified health plan pool and Vermont's Health Benefit Exchange, and it will uh, mean that their premium increase will be a little less than 1% higher than it would have been. So 1% of it, what's the average uh, annual premium for an individual policy? You know, for uh, an individual policy, um, individual up to family could range um, on a monthly basis anywhere from 550 um, to $700. So, so could you do five the and a half bucks a, a month? I'll let you do the math. <laughs> no, we're asking you to do the math. <laughs> Can you put a, a number on that? A number on yeah. that? I, I really uh, okay. wouldn't. And the other thing is, I, you know, I think that we all want to view this in the context of not today, but what the premiums are going to be in 2019. Um, and you, we've yet to begin that development. But is it, and it's most base level, 550 a month for an individual premium? That's five and a half bucks a month. We use that number. Okay. Uh, if the the tax cuts took effect January first, uh, why does the premium reduction not take effect until the beginning of next year? That's a great question. Um, so um, we no longer have a federal tax uh, obligation. We begin to reflect that immediately in our filings to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, the first one we have is would go in for May of this year. Uh, they will approve that by August, and it'll be effective for January one, two thousand and nineteen. Will other, uh, will the other insurers do the same? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think, uh, if, and maybe others could uh, answer this, but I believe that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is fairly unique. Uh, it's a nonprofit. I'm not sure if it does the same. Holds true for the others like MVP, uh, but we'll certainly be looking at that to, to uh, ask them if they, if they are or they aren't and what effect it will have on them and their rates. Have you heard from any of the uh, I, other insurers? I have not at this point in time. So it looks like the legislature is going to take a break next week. Are you satisfied with their progress today? I, th I think this is where uh, you get to leave if you like. <laughs> I may need a lifeline, but uh, feel free. <laughs> if your staff can provide it, I'm sure. Um, we still have another uh, about a day and a half, uh, and uh, hopefully that they'll <laughs> be able to, uh, to put some measures forward. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, there are some initiatives that I'd like to see move uh, some of the Proposals that I put uh, put forward uh, certainly uh, the debate on s21 221 is one that we're interested in um, passing uh, the Senate it appears I, I think they take it up for third reading today uh, And I would expect that they would uh, as they have with other bills that we want to expedite I would ex expect that they would message their actions taken on that to the house uh, so that they could consider this even tomorrow you, you had asked for that bill to be expedited before town meeting day. It doesn't look like they're going to make that. There's still, that there's still a way to do it. Um, <laughs> there really is. Uh, and, and I would say if um, I was somewhat surprised that they didn't take it up for third reading with a 30-0 vote in the Senate yesterday, but be that as it may, uh, having it come out uh, today for third reading, they could still message it to the House today. It could be taken up tomorrow with some rule suspensions. And uh, it could be, uh, if they did that properly, uh, and there was consensus, uh, then it could be uh, on my desk tomorrow night. Would that just be 221? Uh, it appears uh, 221 is an area, it seems as though when you read the tea leaves, so to speak, uh, that there is uh, a lot of support for that coming with a 30-0 vote in the, in the uh, Senate. Uh, and I believe that uh, they might see somewhat uh, uh, some accept, uh, uh, acceptability to that in the in the House as well. The the question about 221 between the Senate and the House is over the House Bill 420, 422, um, and some in the House might like to combine them rather than pass a clean 221. Yeah. I guess my question is, how do you feel about 422? Yeah, I'm in favor of 422, um, and I understand com combining the two. Uh, but uh, from my standpoint right now, uh, standing here today, if there is any consensus on one of them, uh, let's get it done. Uh, let us pass this. Let's send the message that we're taking this seriously uh, and that everyone is on board. And then we can work on 422 uh, after, uh, after the break next week and when we come back. It's still going to be an issue. There are other initiatives that, that I'd like to see uh, taken up, and uh, we'll be able to take those up uh, when they return. What are those? 
Well, there was a number of uh, issues that I had uh, asked uh, to, that we consider. Um, you know, raising the age uh, from 18 to 21, I thought was a good idea. Uh, the uh, the ban on bump stocks, I thought that was a good idea. Uh, they have some other bills as well uh, that should be considered. Uh, putting forward, um, you know, I'm I'm all ears uh, to what they would like to do uh, in in order to give um, uh, Vermonters a sense of 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 uh, accomplishment in some respects that we're taking this seriously and that we uh, we aim to do uh, something in a much better way. You mentioned Governor. regulating high capacity magazines as well. Uh, the possibilities when you're open to is that a discussion that you've had with lawmakers? Have not at this point in time, uh, but uh, I expect that'll be on the table as well. I'm, I'm you know, uh, I'm watching with interest uh, what's happening on the national level, and it's encouraging to see, uh, to be honest with you that there is some consideration from both sides of the aisle, even the president, on some of this, uh, these issues. So I'm hopeful uh, that uh, this will give some comfort to those who uh, aren't feeling as though they want to move forward, uh, that, uh, that we're all in this together. Let's take the politics out of this, and let's do what's right for uh, the, our, uh, all across the U.S., uh, but here in Vermont as well. Governor, the Senate is considering, and expected to consider, an amendment that would raise the legal age for purchasing firearms to age 21, but it would not include an exception if um, youth are taking a firearms class. Is that something you could get behind? Well, again, I, it could be, uh, but I, I think it would uh, make a lot of sense if we could have some of those uh, caveats that I talked about, uh, if you served in the military. Uh, that you would uh, you would get an exemption, uh, as well as if you're in law enforcement, you get an exemption. And I believe that uh, if you've uh, uh, you've been um, involved in a uh, hunter safety, completed a hunter safety course or a gun safety course uh, uh, successfully, uh, that you would be given consideration. But again, I'm uh, I've come a long ways, and and if that's what comes uh, to be at the end, uh, I could uh, I could find a way to support that as well. But I'd like them to consider those other actions. Have you had any further thoughts about S6, the, you know, the background check? Well, again, that will be coming up. I, I, I've, uh, I think I said last week uh, I'm amenable uh, to considering any and all. And, uh, and I believe that this uh, issue is going to be coming up even uh, as, um, uh, as uh, close uh, to us as tomorrow. In the in the Senate, so uh, the Senate this afternoon is folded into S fifty five. Okay, so it'll start this afternoon, and uh, we'll see where the conversation goes from there. And why is it important to to have something in hand before town meeting? I think Vermonters are looking for us to do something, and uh, and again, I, I think this sends a message uh, that we are uh, that we care. Uh, we uh, can put politics aside, and we can do what we think is right, what makes sense, common sense. And I think that uh, just providing uh, this one one bill uh, and it, that we can agree to, and moving forward, I think would send a strong message to Vermonters. You said the Ed Finance plan <coughs> that has been advanced in the income tax bill moves away from education reforms. What do you mean by that? What reforms does it move away from? The, well, from my understanding, the House proposal mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and I'm still trying to catch up from okay. what happened last night. Uh, but it appears that they've merged the two together. Uh, the, some of the proposals that I would like to see for tax relief, uh, they've merged them with the education uh, reform yes. package. So I think it complicates uh, the issue from my standpoint. I don't see uh, that there's uh, been any serious look at uh, cost containment. Uh, we're still uh, going to complicate matters in some respects by uh, having an income tax uh, proposal uh, there may be some uh, reduction in property taxes, but at the end of the day, uh, if we're not spending less, we're going to pay just as much. It's just going to come out of a different pocket. Mm -hmm. So the cost containment part they talk about is referred to as the Beck Amendment or the Beck Maneuver, I mean. Is, <laughs> is um, <coughs> you don't see that as cost containment? I don't see that as uh, the type of cost containment uh, in the near term. That we need right now. So you're just focused on FY19. I think we need to look at both uh, both approaches, both uh, short term and long term, and we have there are a number of proposals that we move forward with uh, that could be considered. On Friday, the original proposal, they, the House Ways and Means voted on it, and they said, "Look, we'll just delay this for a year because we're not ready for showtime right now." That proposal, as you know, had had 40 
forty seven thousand dollar income threshold and tiered income tax and half the property tax and so on. Did you, did you like that plan? Well, again, I, I wanted to make sure I was willing to be open minded in terms of uh, considering any different type of formula that came forward. Uh, admittedly, I think uh, an income tax proposal uh, where um, it may complicate that for uh, taxpayers uh, when they feel as though they're getting uh, a property tax reduction, which they would be, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not getting a reduction out of their pocketbooks in the end. So I was uh, concerned uh, that uh, it was just, uh, again, a way uh, to, to make the, uh, the whole uh, picture murky. Uh, that without cost containment on the other end, uh, it was uh, all for naught. Um, but, but again, I was willing to consider most anything, uh, but cost containment is something that we have to be serious about. So does the latest proposal, which came out yesterday, does it get even further away from tying property tax expenses with school budgets? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it gets any thinking? further away, uh, but um, it doesn't get any closer. Okay. Do you, like, do you think we should abolish the income sensitivity? I think that the, it does give uh, some uh, sense of uh, security that everything is okay mm -hmm. uh, when uh, I think our spending is uh, a bit out of control. So is it fair to say you'd like to get rid of the income sensitivity program? Well, I think it could be part of the mix. Uh, again, uh, I'm, more con I'm more concerned uh, with the cost-saving measures uh, that we haven't seen much action on. And that's where I wish uh, that the legislature would, would put it, spend more time on that. Yeah, I feel like you can really answer my question. Would, would you like to get rid of the income sensitivity program? I am willing to have that conversation. That's but, I, but, but I'm willing to have that conversation in conjunction uh, with any cost containment. Uh, and that, that's the answer I'm going to give and I'll continue to give. Uh, because I believe that we have to, it has to be done simultaneously. Because you can't have one without the other. Maybe we'll get an answer sometime. Maybe. Uh, go when, they, when they take up cost containment, maybe we will have this conversation. <laughs> and I'll let you know that. Uh, Senator Sears is holding a hearing tomorrow morning in Judiciary, which is titled something like, What Specific Language Would You Support? And uh, your chief counsel is going to be there, one of the witnesses. Um, and the senator is very interested in not, not hearing everything is on the table, everything, you know, everything is open to discussion, but getting to specifics. Uh, is she going to be able to deliver any specifics tomorrow morning? Um, you know, I, what you outlined last week? Yeah, I haven't uh, spoken to Jay about this in her testimony uh, tomorrow, uh, but, um, but certainly uh, I've moved uh, in, in, in favor of certain proposals that I'm willing to, uh, to t have the conversation about and move forward with. And uh, she's uh, uh, I'm more than willing to have her speak about those and, and again, consider anything else that they might have that they'd like to consider. But again, I hope that we move forward, really concentrate on 221 over the next uh, uh, day and a half. Governor Baker and Governor Cuomo have, uh, are part of this Northeast uh, Gun Safety Coalition. They've signed them, uh, MOUs, I guess, uh, to establish sort of a regional approach to, to gun safety. Uh, so we're sort of surrounded in a sense except for those uh, wayward people in New Hampshire. Um, is that something you're interested in? It's something that I've asked our general counsel and uh, uh, public safety to take a look at. Uh, it may make some sense uh, for us to be a part of that. I was uh, uh, somewhat surprised uh, when I went to the National Governors Association meeting and uh, seeing that they had a press conference on Thursday or Friday uh, announcing uh, this uh, three or four state coalition. Uh, when they had never reached out to us or, or Governor Baker at that time. Uh, in fact, I, I was at, uh, at the table with Governor Baker, and we spoke about that, and I asked him if he had been, uh, been briefed on that, and he had not. Uh, so uh, Saturday afternoon, I believe uh, Governor Malloy uh, had approached both of us and said, uh, asked if we would be supportive, and uh, I said we would take a look at it. Uh, but it was unfortunate that... We we're going to meet in, in D.C. We we're all going to be there. In fact, we had a meeting of the uh, Northeast uh, Governors Association uh, on Sunday morning, which we were all going to attend. And uh, I thought that would have been an, a, a great time to discuss it. But unfortunately, uh, this has uh, uh, taken a, a bit of a political turn. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll assess this and see if it makes sense for Vermont to be a part of this. 
Did Governor, has Governor Baker given you any more uh, insight into the uh, degree of patience Massachusetts has with respect to Northern Pass vis-a-vis -vis the Lake Champlain project? He ha has not. Uh, he has uh, had made uh, mention, I think, in one of the meetings that uh, that I have been patiently waiting, and I keep saying that eventually you'll get back to us. So are you still hopeful? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they want something to happen sooner rather than later. And when I look at some of the other proposals, I'm not sure that they're all um, a, a shovel a shovel ready. They don't have all their permits, which we have. And, uh, and I continually uh, try to promote the fact uh, that we could act sooner rather than later, and I'm not sure that the other proposals can. But they'll find that out. That's part of their, uh, that part of the, some of the questions they have to ask themselves. Were you there for President Trump's speech to the uh, NGA? I was not. I left on uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, so I missed the White House dinner and uh, and the conversation the next day. I was looking forward to asking you about his his insistence that he would have run into the school. Right. <laughs> yeah. Tough to put yourself in that situation, I would imagine. Uh, I can't. I, I don't know how anybody could uh, say that they would do or not do. I think we all hope we do the right thing, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, who do you think should be the next Burlington mayor? <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not going to weigh into that because I could. Uh, help or hurt uh, any candidate I might <laughs> might pick, uh, but it's an interesting uh, election, uh, and I'm sure we'll know more a week from now. I'd be able to tell you that probably then. Can you speak about where you stand on the F35 ballot initiative, and whether or not you think that, uh, say, there's popular support to resist uh, Yeah, I'm 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 all in for the F35. I think it's uh, be extremely beneficial for Vermont in its entirety. Uh, it's part of. Uh, Part of our economy and uh, part of the uh, the uh, economic opportunity in the future uh, for Vermont. So I've been uh, consistent in uh, in advocating for that initiative. Would you be okay if uh, the Air Force sent a different plane? Uh, I don't know what that would be, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but I, I want to make sure that we have an active uh, uh, airport and that we have an active base. Uh, because it, again, it's uh, it's essential for our economy in that region. So a different aircraft or a different mission would be okay with you, if, as long as it preserves the jobs. Uh, I'm very concerned about the jobs. I haven't heard that there is any other uh, airplane under consideration. I, they've done a tremendous amount of work in at the base already, in anticipation of the F-35. I would have a hard time believing there's anything else under consideration. Is Lake Carmine in crisis? Um, they, there, are, there is no doubt. Uh, there are a number of problems on Lake Carmine. Uh, have been for probably decades, and uh, we have some initiatives that we want to put forward. Uh, we hope that they will help mitigate in some respects and uh, and try and provide relief for those camp owners on Lake Carmine. But your officials have said there's no reason to take action right now. But at the end of the day, we should just wait for dairy farmers to go out of business. Is that enough? Yeah, I don't think that's enough. Uh, we're planning some aerators, uh, I believe, um, to try and mitigate that damage, or the, at least uh, try and provide relief, as I said before. Is that enough? Oh, it's not enough, but it's, uh, again, a, a sh a one approach uh, that we can take as we take other approaches, uh, trying to, again, mitigate in any amount of phosphorus entering the lake. I mean, I th I've talked about this before, and that's part of this initiative that I, I believe has some merit uh, that we should look uh, to others, have the shark tank approach where we consider uh, some uh, entrepreneurial approaches uh, to dealing with the phosphorus before it hits the ground and uh, it becomes a problem. Because what we have in this state is we have more phosphorus coming in than we have leaving. and when when uh, we're trying to deal with it after it uh, leaves the, the farm, so to speak, and, and goes into the uh, lakes and streams. So if we, can, uh, if we can take care of that sooner rather than later, I think that would be helpful over the long term. But we have, uh, we have to do some things as well to clean up the lake, and, uh, and we're putting some 
measures in place uh, sooner rather than later. So how long are the Shark Tank idea take hold? Um, they're working on it now. I, you know, I don't, I don't years, know. Right? I'm sorry? It could be years. <laughs> well, I, you know, we'll see. We'll see. So people should just live with toxic water in the neighborhood? I didn't say that. We're, we've devoted, uh, uh, committed uh, to $50 million worth of, uh, of uh, uh, projects and initiatives uh, to try and uh, clean up our lakes and streams. So we're moving forward with that, and we'll, we'll stay committed to that, and we'll keep putting money into that. Um, but, but we should take and consider other approaches as well. But the only source of pollution there is the farms, right? So no, it's not the only source. Is that Lake Carmel? Oh, I don't, yeah, maybe Lake Carmel. I mean, probably most of that, I would say, probably is, but I'm not a scientist. So why is there any effort to require farmers not to use manure over commercial? Well, I think they are taking uh, different uh, best management practices. Uh, I think they are doing um, all, all, alternative uh, crop uh, uh, placement. Uh, uh, they're creating buffers and so forth. I mean, I think they're, they're doing, uh, taking some steps uh, as well. So. It's all of us working together in order to accomplish that. And you think that's enough for the homeowners up there in the lake? Um, probably not. Uh, I, you know, if I was in their position, I would be anxious as well. But, uh, but we're doing everything we can at this point. So the farmers are more important. I'm sorry. The farmers are more important than the residents up there. Well, farming is very important too. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our culture. Uh, it's a three billion dollar industry for Vermont. So I would say it's it's important. I was talking to a Republican lawmaker this morning from a rural part of the state, and he said that he has been stunned at the reaction on the gun issue, even from his constituents, that there seems to be an overwhelming groundswell and the feeling that this is still growing. Um, I think you met with Middlebury Middle School students I this did. morning. Um, I they seem to have a powerful message as well. Do you see this still? in process still evolving. I, I do. Um, it is uh, remarkable. Uh, I mean, I look at my own, uh, myself, uh, it's evolving on this issue in a quick uh, amount of time. And uh, I think it's happening uh, across the state, across the country. Uh, I think we owe uh, our students uh, a lot of credit for keeping highlighting this issue and continuing uh, to move forward. And when I met with the, that group this morning, um, they were uh, they asked great questions. Uh, they were they were great advocates, uh, and I think uh, we need to encourage that. And I hope they don't stop because, uh, as a result of their action, uh, we're taking action as well. And I think that's helpful. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.